All right, so if you have been watching some of my interactions with the, twi with the quantum mechanics experts, the Twitter experts on quantum mechanics, you may be wondering what is actually going on in this, this interplay. Well, one of the things that's going on is that if somebody rolls up on you on Twitter, somebody enters a threat, and you don't know who they are, and they enter with pomposity and insults, and that's exactly what happened with some of these guys. There's, apparently, there are all these experts on quantum mechanics. Can't wait to show this Christian what time it is. You guys don't think, you guys don't know anything about quantum mechanics. You guys better crack open some textbooks. Anybody who enters a threat, this is a hard, fast rule in life, and it sort of applies in Twitter, too. As far as I can tell, it's a general rule of thumb on Twitter, too. I won't tell you take it to the bank. In real life, take it to the bank. Anytime somebody rolls up on you with insults and condescension, there's a really good chance that guy don't know jack squat about what he's talking about. Why? Because people who know what they're talking about don't act like that. Someone who uh, rolls up with condescension is trying to intimidate you, is trying to get you to not check their work, not confront them. It's called an intellectual bully or an intellectual poser. The reason why they act like that is because they don't actually substantively, they don't really have mastery of the topic. First of all, if somebody has mastery of the topic, I'm not presenting myself as an expert on quantum mechanics. I'm only, only presenting one thing about quantum mechanics and how it defeats materialism. And the thing I've been presenting, I will present again in this video really clearly so everybody understands. I'm telling you the God's honest truth. It is a mainstream position in science. And the people who have been rolling up on me don't understand what I'm talking about. Why? Because they don't understand quantum mechanics. Because they're basically idiots. Which is fine. Nobody has to understand quantum mechanics. But they don't enter a thread talking about, you know, the, the, the latest one, Theophilus, was one of the most egregious. And I started getting a little aggressive with him right off the bat. Some of you may question that. Don't. At some point, I'll get really good at that on Twitter. That's how you handle a bully, guys. That's the only language they understand. Aggression. If you know someone is being a bully and a poser, and you just kind of back down and, oh, I'm so Mr. Nice Christian. That's not Christianity. That's just weakness. It's just weakness. It's not Christianity. You're not being a great Christian. Oh, you know, God bless you, brother. I wish you could be a little nicer to poor little us. That's not Christianity. Jesus wasn't just a lamb. He was a lamb to the broken, the hurted, the confused, the troubled, the hurting, the vulnerable. That's who he was tender and kind and patient and long-suffering with. To the Pharisees, he's right back in their face. Right back in their face immediately. Why? Because that's how you handle know-it-all clowns like that. That's how you're supposed to do it. That's the only language they understand. You tell them where to go, and you tell them quickly. Metaphorically, it goes like this. Pow! Ow! <laughs> yeah, I didn't ask. <laughs> that's exactly how it goes. That's exactly how you handle a bully in real life. I mean, I never have to encounter that in real life. In real life, nobody ever squares off against me in real life, I promise almost never happens. It happened to me once. And there's reasons for that. As you may be able to infer just by listening to my videos, I'm pretty loud, okay? Really easy for me to enter a conversation and within minutes be one of the loudest, most dominant personalities in the room. It happens easily. I have to dial it down in real life. I really do. Otherwise, I could be the only one talking, dominant the whole conversation, telling stories all night. <laughs> I swear to God. So very rarely does anybody ever confront or square off against me in real life. Happened once in the last four years. My wife still drives me to social events. If, that, if my wife wasn't involved, I probably wouldn't go. Once upon a time, I was really social, would hang out with anybody all over the world and was out all the time with friends. Been there, done that, don't really need to anymore. It's not what I'm about. I'd much prefer to you know, be in my humble little apartment on the beach, watching a cool YouTube video or a Netflix video, hanging out with my wife, petting my little cat, you know, I'd much prefer that these days. You know, as you start getting older, too. You know, as you start getting older, you start calculating. You want to go drive over the hills and go hang out with so-and-so. And, -so, and you're kind of like, well, we're going to get home at 12. I don't want to get home that late. I got this to do the next morning. You start thinking more like... So my wife drags me to events, basically, is the long and the short of it. And one time in the last four years, somebody confronted me. Once! 
And this is exactly how it went. I swear to God, this is true. It's the only time anybody confronted me in like the last five years. Started telling me something. I forget what the actual thing was, but he was telling me something about my wife, Jennifer. And I really didn't ask. <laughs> he was giving me some sort of like, this is what you should do. And I was like, yeah, exactly. I didn't ask. So he says whatever he says to me. And this is exactly what I did. Long, awkward silence. Really awkward. I made sure of that. Really awkward, really pregnant silence. Yeah, a lot of pregnant. Really awkward silence. He starts feeling really uncomfortable. I'm obviously mad. And I could be saying, you know, how dare you think you got anything to tell me about my wife? Who on earth do you think you are? That's what I could be saying I'm not. Why? Because it's a lot more intense for me to just be quiet and hold that awkward silence. Really intense. <laughs> it starts being really uncomfortable for him. And then eventually I go, I didn't ask. Uh-huh, that's interesting. I didn't ask. That was it. Never, that guy never confronted me again about that ever again. That's it. That's all I did. That's how you handle bullies in real life. That's how you handle aggressive people in real life. The reason why I never have to do it wise is I'm really good at it in real life. Do it in my sleep. I didn't think that through. That's just naturally what I did because the guy was way out of line. I'm going to ask him, are you kidding my wife? Are you kidding me? That's not up for discussion, Junior. <laughs> it's not even close. You better watch out. You do that again and that'll be a problem. That's exactly what I communicated to him. And he got that message loud and clear. That's how you handle a bully in real life. You answer them with aggression. Why? Because it's the only thing they understand. That's the only language they understand. And a guy who is rolling up with insults is basically just trying to bully people and push them around. And I sensed that right away. So I was being aggressive with him. Maybe a little bit too much. I don't think it was too much, but maybe. I'll give you a little bit too much. Fine. But I knew for a fact the guy didn't know what he was talking about, why I could tell from tweet one. And sure enough, we start talking about quantum mechanics. I ask him what is interpreta favorite interpretation. What does that matter? Then he starts trying to quiz me. <laughs> like, like this is just some sort of contest of quant first of all, if it's Einstein himself if this guy was Einstein himself and rolled up with insults saying you guys really need to crack textbooks if you don't know what you're talking about I would tell Einstein himself to go take a hike not interested <laughs> you're probably really intelligent about quantum mechanics but you're acting like a clown, go away that's what I tell Einstein and this guy, Theoph Theophilus, if you're listening you ain't no Einstein guy <laughs> you're not even close you don't even understand the basic concepts, dude, that was clear in your interchange with Stuart. And you were brimming with condescension towards Stuart, who's a perfectly cool guy. He just understands what quantum mechanics is about. I swear to God, this Theophilus guy knew he was a clown right from tweet one. I could tell. That's why I was getting aggressive with them. Why? Because that's how you answer people like that. It's the only language they understand. That's the only language they understand. If you give them the opportunity to push you around, they will just push you around. Don't even really think about it in real life. Why well, it never happens to me. Like I said, in real life I'm pretty, pretty big personality, pretty dominating naturally, without even trying to be. You know? Twitter, you can't tell that. I'm just another little guy with a little Tweety thing. I'm just another little Tweety bird. Whatever you call a Twitter person. But anyways, he, 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 go look at his interchange with Stuart. He put him down like five times. Do you just got to go crack a textbook? Oh, I can't believe these people embarrass themselves with how little they know. It's, it's such an obnoxious jerk. First of all, I never bother talking to somebody like that in real life. I don't care if it was Einstein. If Einstein came up to me to just tell me I just don't know, you know, physics that well, and how I'm, I don't know anything about space-time, I'd be like, okay, yeah, okay, probably, but I don't really want to talk to you about it. And this wasn't Einstein. This was just a doofus. So the fact that he was acting like that was basically almost totally insufferable. It was unendurable. It was literally unendurable. But he didn't understand the concept of quantum mechanics. What I am telling you about quantum mechanics, okay, is why I'm making this video to clarify. What I am saying out there about quantum mechanics as it relates to materials of mainstream physics. It's not woo. It's not a Christian trying to make, you know, the Holy Spirit appear through quantum mechanics. It's mainstream physics. So let's explain. Day one. De the dawn of the quantum era. The first thing they will teach you in a physics class at college, sophomore level physics class, the first thing you will learn, and this was, the implications were obvious right from the start. 
prior to measurement, the quote-unquote real material world exists as a wave of probabilities. That's the part right there. Nothing more needs to be said. That's the part that trips all the scientists out. Why? Probabilities. A wave of probabilities means it hasn't occurred yet. That's the core mystery. How could the measurement not actually be there? And scientists get tripped out by probabilistic. Why, it sounds too close to subjective, emotional. Ah! Dirty word, dirty word! It sounds too close to things they don't like to even think about. They are ideologues when it comes to materialism. Why? Because they have been trained to be. Just the facts, run the data, run the data, just the facts, run the data. Now, Carlo Rovelli, thank God, is starting to walk away from the ideologue part of being a scientist. But the fact of the matter is the implication is there right from the start. Prior to measurement, the real material world exists as a wave of probability, which means to some degree it isn't there. To what degree, we don't know, but to some degree, it isn't actually there. That's the clear implication, philosophically. And the interpretations of quantum mechanics are a way of trying to reconcile the obvious fact. And there are only four mainstream interpretations right now. There are a couple others, but there are only four that are considered mainstream. Okay? And they are trying to reconcile that fact. That is, many worlds interpretation, Bohmian mechanics, otherwise known as pilot wave, relational quantum mechanics, the one I've been talking about the whole time. Why? Because it is the correct one, and I will demonstrate that in this video. And Copenhagen interpretation. Those are the four main ones that are considered mainstream. There are other interpretations, but those ones are considered mainstream science. Now, of those four, two of those are basically a case study in motivated reasoning. Bohmian mechanics and many worlds are a case study in motivated reasoning. What's the motivation? The clear implication prior to measurement, the particle it isn't actually there yet. Then you take a measurement and now it exists in time and space as what? Particle. So what I've been saying the whole time is the God's honest truth. The real material world both is and isn't there. And that's what is tripping out the scientists. Why? Because that doesn't really make sense to them. It both is and isn't there. And what's the answer is that it only exists relationally, relational quantum mechanics. The real material world has no standalone ontology like I've been saying the entire time. I told that to our great expert Theophilus and he starts accusing me of not knowing what I'm talking about. Why? Because he didn't understand what I meant. Because you didn't understand what I meant, dude. Not because I was wrong, because you were too arrogant and you didn't understand it and instead of going thinking about it and trying to understand it, you doubled down on I'm the smartest guy in town when you're not. You may think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand it conceptually at all. What, what I'm telling you is mainstream. And I post a link to a video that explains this really clearly by Carlo Rovelli, Relational QM. You know what he says? Guess what he says? Sounds like an argument from authority. <laughs> everything that guy has learned about quantum mechanics, everything I have learned by qu about quantum mechanics, everything anybody listening to me has learned about physics at all, you have learned by virtue of authority. <laughs> the textbook he keeps demanding we read was written by what? An authority. Yeah, yeah, rocket science, dude. When I tell you these guys aren't that sharp, I'm not trying to pimp myself out. I'm telling you these guys are kind of meathead morons. They're a little bit smarter than your average debate me bro clown atheist, but not by that much. The reason why he was challenging me is because he didn't understand what I meant by the real material world has no standalone ontology. So he thinks I don't know what I'm talking about. Why? Because he doesn't understand what that means. And that ain't that complicated. And that's mainstream quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics 101. So let's get to the four interpretations. What they are and why two of them are exercises in motivated reasoning. As I've said, the scientists are uncomfortable with the idea that the measurement is probabilistic in nature. Why? Because that strikes them as not scientific. Just because they've been trained ideologically to recoil at that. Probabilistic. That means subjective. 
It's feelings or something. <laughs> it's something like that, I swear to God. So, pilot wave, bombing mechanics, or pilot wave. Sounds like exactly what it is, conceptually. It is not probably, it's trying to, it's an exercise in motivated reasoning. What is it saying? That it isn't a wave of probabilities. The particle has a definite location. We just don't know exactly what that location is going to be. Why? The, the particle is being piloted through the wave function, hence the name pilot wave, to a specific place. And we just don't know why because of these quote-unquote hidden variables that we just can't see that are piloting it to a specific place. So it's not probabilistic at all. That's exactly what that interpretation is trying to do. Bending over backwards to take the probabilistic out of the equation. Why? Because they're uncomfortable. You could stay a materialist if pilot wave holds. You can stay a materialist if many worlds holds, which I've been saying the whole time. Why? Because those reconcile the fact, they, they answer the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics with trying to be more specific and precise about a measurement that would indicate that the real, um, real material world has standalone ontology. That's why I posted the link by, by uh, Sean Carroll. He owns this. He says this out loud on the link I posted. Sean Carroll says, I'm a scientist, so I want to believe in reality. That's what he says. It's why he holds to the many worlds. Because he thinks it helps it because it keeps you in materialism. Many worlds interpretation is basically there is no collapse of the wave function, so to speak. You are taking a measurement of a, of a particle, but in order for that to be true, you are, you are one person taking a measurement in one world, and this one world has standalone ontology. It's a real material world, and it obeys all the laws and principles of science as we commonly understand it, except the problem is, in order for that to be true, there are infinities of these worlds being created all the time that you can't see. It's literally insane, guys. It's literally an insane postulate. But it allows you to stay a materialist. Why? Because it means the actual world you're standing in right now has standalone ontology, and it's a measurement, a precise measurement, without any probabilities involved in this particular world. But in order for that to be true, the wave function means that there are you know, an infinity of invisible carbon copy worlds that you can't see. And they're just like this one. But in that other carbon copy world, the measurement came out a different way. That's how he gets rid of the probabilistic nature. By channeling the probabilistic nature into, you know, thousands of different worlds that could have had a different result. It's insane, guys. It's literally insane. And at some point, Sean Carroll is not so much of an idealist that he won't eventually move away from it. Why? Because it's crazy. It's absolutely demented. The only reason it has standing is because scientists like him people who have good reputations. His work is pretty solid in a lot of ways. I listen to a lot of his stuff. But when he starts talking many worlds, as I pointed out, it's why I pointed the video up, put the video up. Got to listen carefully. But what I'm telling you is true is true. He says it himself. I believe this. Why? Because I want to stay a realist. That's why I believe this insane insanity. And Carlo Rovelli kind of chuckles and goes, well, yeah, I want to be a realist too, within reason, pal. <laughs> within reason. But I'm not going to bend over backwards to try and make up crazy stuff so that we can all stay materialists. Because those are the only two that keep us as materialists. Copenhagen interpretation is basically not interpreting. It's run the facts, run the data, more or less. <laughs> don't, don't bother. Don't interpret it. Just run the equations. We know the equations work, more or less. It's the famous cat in the box thing, and they were trying to prove, they were actually, the, the whole cat in the box experiment, as far as my understanding is, and I, I'm, again, I'm not an expert on quantum mechanics. I understand this one aspect really well. Why? Because I've been thinking carefully about it, and I paid attention to the lectures by Carlo Rovelli. Carlo Rovelli is an expert on quantum mechanics. And no, that's not an argument from authority. Everything you have learned about physics at all, you've learned, either in a classroom, which is an authority, a textbook, which is an authority, a lecture which is an authority, a YouTube video which sometimes is an authority. Talk about Sabina Hofstetter or Arvin Ash, those are authorities. As far as I'm concerned, those, their, their videos are legit. Mainstream interpretations is what we are talking about. The only possible one left is relational quantum mechanics. And what it states is what I'm telling you it's been stating the whole time. 
materials, the real material world to some degree isn't actually there. It has no standalone ontology. That isn't as trippy as the scientists are pretending it is. It's really not. Once upon a time, it would have been really trippy for me to, for you to, me to tell you, you know, the Earth revolves around the sun. Why? Because it just seems so counterintuitive. This is the same idea. It just seems really counterintuitive. It isn't all that counterintuitive. Why it seems really counterintuitive is deceptive. Because look at a table in front of you and think to yourself. You are representing it back to yourself as what? Solid matter, correct? Go look at a table right in front of you right now. You are re-representing it back to yourself as solid matter. Okay, that's a fiction. That's a fiction. It is particles in motion. You can't really perceive it like that. There's a lot of those type of fictions going on. In the house that you are inhabiting, you're in a house right now, you're in an apartment. It, is, it seems to you rock solid and it's solid matter and it has st standalone ontology. It's definitely there, 100%. It isn't quite really. What it actually is at the quantum level is particles in motion floating around in space. That's what it actually is. And the scientists kind of know that. They just haven't yielded to what that information actually means. It means materialism fails. Why? Because materials itself could never be the ontological primitive. Why? Because of everything I've been saying in these videos. If the real material world does not have standalone ontology. It exists relationally. And the best way to think about that, the best case scenario is what I've been talking about, is how Carlo Rovelli wound up explaining it too. Think of a quality like velocity. There is no such thing as velocity as a standalone ontology. It only exists relationally. So you can't just say, how fast is the train going? The, tr the question in and of itself is incoherent. It's only how fast is the train going in relation to what? To either a person standing on the, 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 uh, the ground watching it go by, then it's going 100 miles an hour. To a person, yeah, they're going to, yeah, they're, I know, they're coming. They're coming for the cray. I understand that. They're not going to take me alive. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. They won't take, they'll never take me alive. You've got a name, cop. Um, velocity has no standalone ontology. It too, like materials, only exists relationally. So you ask, how fast is the train going? If you are standing on the ground next to the train, it's going past you at 100 miles per hour. If you are standing inside the train, the train is standing still. Think of the real material world the exact same way. It only exists in relationship. If you are a person, a conscious agent, it only exists in relationship to you. It does, it, it does have some standalone ontology, but not quite the way we thought. Not to the degree we thought. That's the only thing. Sean Carroll will eventually yield the ground. Well, he's not that much of an ideologue. He's not a Patricia Churchland, and he's not a Daniel Dennett. He's not a, like, I'm going to believe this come hell or hard, hard, hard water type of guy. First of all, he has a lot of conversations with people like Carlo Rovelli. And eventually, Carlo Rovelli is going to make it clear to him that he is just mistaken, and he will leave the position behind. Materialism fails. Why? Because the real material world has no standalone ontology. It only exists in relationship. And relational quantum mechanics says it exists in relation to a set of properties. It is a set of properties that exist in relation to another set of properties. Now, now, Carlo Rovelli has bent over backwards to try and process the idealism out of relational quantum mechanics. So he's not even saying it exists in relation to a conscious agent. He's liking it more to like uh, um, um, uh, a thermostat, an automatic thermostat in your apartment will respond to the temperature. It doesn't mean it's conscious. It will respond to the atmospheric conditions in your, in your room. It doesn't mean it's conscious. He's saying the material world is somewhat like that. It is, exists in relationship to other sets of properties and they affect how it operates. So he has tried to process the conscious agent out to get rid of idealism. I think the conscious agent needs to be processed back in. That's the only tweaking. Now, I don't know how that happens. I'm not a, I am not a physicist. But if the choice comes down to materialism versus idealism, idealism wins hands down. 
and so far there are only two options, the choice is binary. There is also a form of idealism popularized by Donald Hoffman known as conscious realism. That is the one that I think will win the day ultimately. Why? Because it's the more parsimonious of the two. Let me see if I'm running out of time. Uh, I, Bernardo Castro, I really like. I've been listening to him a lot. He's been really influential on me in these past few months. Read two and a half of his books, listened to a lot of his lectures. I do not think that his version of idealism is correct. Why? Because his version of mind at large is kind of saying that there isn't a real material world at all. Well, that's not 100% correct. See, once you get, start getting at these high levels talking about this stuff, the language you use has to be precise, and there's not a lot of room for maneuvering. That's why this is going to be settled science relatively soon. Why? Because the mathematics are precise. And the four options I told you about are really the only four mainstream positions. And three of them are really obviously not so. So relational quantum mechanics is the only one left. And it's, it's really, really the most parsimonious and, reckoned, and helps account for the data the most completely. The only thing that needs to be put back in is somehow it needs to be idealistic a tiny bit. Now there are types, all different types of idealism. And some of the ones that are the least plausible are saying that I, because I'm thinking, I am somehow creating. Those are the ones that they're saying the conscious agent is causing the collapse of the wave function. The conscious agent is causing the measurement. No. That isn't true. That's going too far. Both Donald Hoffman and Bernardo Castro go a little too far in their idealism. They enter a little bit into woo-woo land. Just a little. But of the two, the Donald Hoffman version is the more parsimonious and the more complete. He calls it conscious realism. It goes like this. Consciousness is. Okay, there's no problem there. Consciousness is the ontological primitive. The only thing that you know for sure, if we go back to the days of I think, therefore I am, the only thing that you know for sure right now is that you are conscious. That's it. Consciousness is the only thing that can be the ontological primitive. Materialism doesn't work as an ontological primitive. For all of the reasons I just said, add 50 more. Materialism fails. Sean Carroll will eventually yield the ground. The new thing in town, the new thing that's coming is going to be idealism, one form of it. And then the, the human nature being what it is, once, once it starts being adopted by a lot of the smart set, this is my prediction, you can take it with a grain of salt if you want to, once it starts being adopted by a lot of the smart set, it's going to offer enormous pr pr explanatory power. Enormous explanatory power. Donald Hoffman is right about a couple of key things. First of all, the real material world. The noumena phenomena distinction that Kant talked about is actually true, and you are perceiving things way differently than they actually occur. Way differently. And you don't know it. We sort of know it, but we don't think about it. There are, he, what he says is you are basically wearing a virtual reality headset, and that is the God's honest truth. You are re-representing the real material world back to yourself in ways totally different from how it actually is. Totally different. And just those explorations alone are going to keep scientists busy for the next hundred years. Just those explorations, those discrepancies alone, the ones I've talked about in my videos, look at the table in front of you. You re-represent it back to yourself as solid matter. You know for a fact it's particles in motion. There are sounds going off in the atmosphere right now. You've heard of a dog whistle. That's a frequency that dogs can hear and humans can't, which means there are sounds going off in the atmosphere that you can't hear. Your senses, to some degree, are also filtering out information that is more noise than signal. If you were just seeing all the stuff that you could possibly see, be really chaotic and confusing, you'd disappear to some type of entropic soup. Why? Because you, your head would explode. So we have been hardwired, not necessarily to misinterpret reality, but to misinterpret it to some degree. Our senses don't just evidence this, us, the world, as it actually occurs. They also filter out a lot of information. And they take shortcuts. This is really obvious. Again, that's why materialism fails too. But so idealism in the Donald Hoffman version, conscious realism is what he calls it, goes like this. Consciousness is. There's no objections. Consciousness is the ontological primitive. This is at least possible. Why? Because that is the one thing you truly know for sure right now is that you are a conscious agent hearing me. And that we are part of a vast network of interconnected conscious agents. We call that metaconsciousness. There's, I haven't added anything.
that's really parsimonious. I haven't added a single thing. The Bernardo Castro adds this like meta consciousness thinking with Bob, this universal, you know, mind at large thing, which I'm cool with why it sounds a lot like God. <laughs> it's, uh, whatever <laughs> you think it sounds like mind at large, it sounds a lot like God, dude. But whatever. It's an extra thing. The Donald Hoffman version, conscious realism, isn't added anything at all. It's just sticking to the facts. And that will pretty soon be the dominant philosophy in going, moving forward. Why? Because it's going to start offering real explanatory power, like really valuable explanatory power, and that's when the rubber meets the road. That's how human beings are, guys. That's how they're wired. The reason why people are ideologically attached to materialism is because it offered enormous explanatory power. It was a fiction right from the start. It is an arbitrary separation of mind and matter that happened 300 years ago, 400 with Descartes. It is arbitrary. Mind and matter were always coming back together. Now there are a lot of different ways to, to interpret this and a lot of different ways to think about it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, there aren't going to be that many. Why? Because when physics are involved, you are talking about mathematical precision. The physics don't lie and they start ruling out possibilities. And we're getting to the point where consensus is going to be formed by the smart set and that consensus is going to be real, it's going to rule out a lot of other possibilities. Materialism is almost completely finished as even a, even a laughable explanation for reality. Why? Because it really obviously failed a hundred years ago. It really obviously failed. Prior to measurement, the real material world exists. You have to put that in quotes as a wave of probabilities, which means it isn't actually there yet. To some degree, it's not really there. There is a more ethereal quality to the world that you inhabit than you have otherwise thought. Now, once you just wrap your brain around that fact, that's not all that like, you, oh, my head's going to explode for thinking of that. Sean Carroll's just being a bit of a like, you know, there's, there's no reason for him to struggle to not, not accept that. Why is this not that hard to, to grok or accept? That's just that simple. The real material world has a more ethereal quality than scientists have been led to believe for the past three or four hundred years. That's it. That's the only thing it means. Doesn't mean I've just proved God and the Holy Ghost is now walking amongst you. Doesn't mean anything other than that. The real material world has a more ethereal quality than scientists have been willing to understand for the past three or four hundred years. They have been acting like materials, materials, solid matter, solid matter is the only story that needs to be told and it really obviously isn't. That's it. That's where we're at so far. And that's just the facts, guys. That's not interpolation. That's not me interpolating <laughs> all different to interpolating. Yeah, interpolating. I'm not interpolating nothing. That ain't nothing but the facts, kids. Promise. And there's not that much room for, you know... There isn't a whole bunch of leg room. Why? Because physics are precise. The four mainstream interpretations of quantum mechanics are the ones I said. There are a couple others and maybe they might gain some standing, but they will have more idealism rather than less. There's a couple others that have more idealism in them. Right now, I'm betting on relational quantum mechanics. I know for a fact that pilot wave and many worlds are, are not, not options. And those are the only ones that keep materialism in play. Why? Because they are basically exercises in motivated reasoning. There are hidden variables that we can't see that make the outcome not probabilistic. That's what it is, pilot wave. That's what it is. There's a hidden variables piloting the particle through the wave function, and we can't see those hidden variables. That's exactly what it means conceptually. When I talk to these, go these goofballs on Twitter, it's worse than a waste of time. It's worse than a waste of time. I probably won't be doing it in the future at, at all. Why? Because they're poser clowns, but they also sow confusion. Why? Because they, they don't understand quantum mechanics conceptually at all, even a little. They don't understand it conceptually at all, even a little. There are people in this space who are going to start inhabiting this space, who, so a lot of them are atheists and agnostics, who know exactly what I'm talking about are going to be on the exact same page as me. Why? Because I ain't talking rocket science, I'm talking the actual facts. And there are a lot of people listening to me right now who know for a fact that I'm telling the God's honest truth and I'm telling you mainstream science. And there are a lot of smart guys. You know, I can think of a lot. That Danny guy was interviewing, interviewing Bernardo Castro. He was asking really good questions. He understands this stuff pretty well. 
There's a lot of people coming up who are going to understand this stuff pretty well. And once you start understanding it pretty well, there isn't all that room for maneuvering. Why? Because it's pretty precise. It's really pretty precise. We aren't talking about wide varieties of possibilities here. We're talking about a handful of interpretations, two of which aren't plausible at all. One isn't really an interpretation. It's let's not interpret. Copenhagen isn't really an interpretation. It's let's just not think about it. <laughs> let's just not think about it, run the fact and run the data. That's it. We'll run the equations. Who cares? Let's not, you know, let's not worry about it. So, day out kids. Just thought I'd give you a little bit. You know, I'll, eventually I will be moving on from the quantum mechanics. But I sincerely doubt I will be debating many people on Twitter about it. There are a couple people here who know what they're talking about. Jeffrey Williams is so far the only person who I say actually really knows the stuff pretty well. But there are other people who will learn this pretty well pretty quick. Why? Because they're smart. They're smart. That Danny kid who picked this up pretty quickly, he's a smart kid. Smart guy. A lot, of, a lot of people are. Christian Ideal is a smart guy. He'll pick this up pretty quickly. Ron, freaking Ron's coming out of left field, <laughs> the brainiac, hiding in the back. He's got a bass player personality, but don't rule out Ron. Why? Because he's smarter than you think he is. Bass player personality. Stays in the background, stays low, <laughs> keeps, keeps the rhythm. <laughs> he's a bass player. I swear to God, bass player personality. That's what he's got. Um, so, there you have it, kids. That is how I see it all going down. At some point, Ron and I are going to train somebody to go out and kick ass and take names. They're going to plant a flag and say, I've come here in the name of Craig Reed to annihilate you imbeciles. And then someone's going to, I was hoping it was Stephanie. Stephanie, yeah, Craig, I'm on it. <laughs> I'm on it, Craig. I'll go a little testament on their ass. They'll be sorry they ever met me. Yes, that's the spirit. That's why I want to train up Stephanie to go out and kick ass and take names. I come here in the name of Craig Reed. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it would be great, but we'll see what happens. We'll see. We're gonna train up. A, we're gonna train up a killer soon. That's my prediction. I don't know for a fact, but that's my guess. You know, one of these hungry young guys. Train. I was thinking John Buck, but he doesn't listen to the video, so we can't train him. It's not listening. <laughs> He'd be great. You know, little pit bull, little intellectual pit bull. Anyways, that is all for now, kids. With that, I will wrap it up. Oakley dokley. The Mass has ended, as they say. The Mass has ended. Go in peace. Amen.